Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, May 15th, 2023. Coming up on the show today, from the Apple TV Plus original series Extrapolations, editor Greg O'Brien. The first thing he pitched me is we don't want these to be the same. They're going to have different directors. They're going to have different writers. Some of the actors will cross over. They may be acting in different tones from episode to episode. This is intentional. This is what we want. I'm very hands-on whether they like it or not. And so I think at a certain point, people just started saying Greg's going to want to weigh in on all the stuff. So we might as well put producer by his name so people don't forget to add him to the email. Every now and then someone points a sharp stick at me and makes me go to set. I don't like it. I don't want to know that that day was really hard and it rained and we didn't get it all or today so-and-so didn't bring their A-game. I don't want to know any of that because none of that matters once I have it in the Abbott. None of that matters. Yes, all that and a little more on this edition of The Rough Cut. Greetings, fellow citizens of Earth and beyond, I suppose. Why not? If there is indeed intelligent life out there, surely they appreciate great editing. And that is what we are here to do on the podcast, appreciate and learn from great storytellers. But today we get to not only do that, but also be a little eco-conscious at the same time. Bonus. But how does that work? Well, it works because we are talking about the Apple TV Plus series Extrapolations, brought to us by Scott Z. Burns. Scott is the same creative mind behind Steven Soderbergh's 2011 film Contagion, among many other things. Scott's series, Extrapolations, is an anthology, or is it? We need to sort that out. But it's a series that depicts the effects of climate change on the planet, that would be ours, from various points of view through interconnected stories. Yeah, see, interconnected. To me, that kind of challenges the idea of an anthology as I know it. But what the hell do I know? Anyway, the concept is that if we extrapolate out the current rise of climate change, this is what the world could look like in the future. Therefore, the series takes place in the future, starting in episode one in 2037. It's a big idea played out in big ways with a big cast. Fortunately, Scott lined up a great editor to help tackle this one. And that would be the editor who also cut his 2019 film, The Report, none other than today's guest, Greg O'Brien. Greg joined us last almost two years ago to talk about his work on the Netflix series, Brand New Cherry Flavor. Man, that show is out there. Really wild, really fun. Give it a look if you have a minute, unless you really love cats. Or maybe you shouldn't if you really don't like cats. I don't know. It's a crazy series. So it is great to have Greg back to talk about a very different kind of series with extrapolations. This one will make you think. And I am sure Scott Burns and his team hope it makes you do more than just think. I believe their goal was to entertain and inform you in a way that makes you act as well. But we'll see what Greg says about that in just a minute. First, a word about the good folks at Extreme Music. Not only are they nice enough to help bring you this interview with Greg, but they can also help you make great TV or movies or anything that needs music. And who doesn't need music? We all need it. Since way, way back in 1997, which is a whole century ago, post-production pros have been trusting their projects to extreme music for the very best in production audio. Wait a minute. I've been saying production audio for I don't know how long. Shouldn't it be post-production audio? Note to self, call extreme music. Either way, this great music is lovingly crafted by A-list musicians, composers, and producers. Names like Bear McCreary, Mark Mothersbaugh, Sylvia Navarro, Junkie XL, Hans Zimmer, Atticus Ross, Quincy Jones, and so many more. Any kind of music you want is there for the asking. Just use their search engine to sort on genre, tempo, style, lyrics, vibe, whatever you need. And do not forget to take advantage of their reference track technology that lets you give them a track so they can find you ones like it. And once all that's done, they have team members who can help you with the licensing. Or you can do it yourself right there online. So fast, so simple, and so good. So help them help you sound your best and visit our friends and Rough Cut sponsor, Extreme Music. All right, time for a little peek into the future of our world by talking to a fantastic editor right here and now. From Extrapolations, here's Greg O'Brien. He knows what he's talking about. It's a big presumption, but I, <laughs> I, I like your confidence. I've seen Extrapolations described both as an eco-drama and an eco-thriller. And I think depending on which particular episode you're watching, one is more appropriate than the other. But I'd love to know how you describe this show. I always like to call it an anthology because of the tones are so different. Although... Scott would push back on that a little bit. It's not a true anthology because there is so much crossover between the characters from the first episode, which, you know, extrapolate out through the course of the series. Uh, but I think it is an eco-drama. I think it's an eco-thriller. And, and, you know, some of them are eco-comedy, too. So we try to do a little bit of everything. And that was by design. That was something Scott planned from the very beginning. The last interview we did for Brand New Cherry Flavor, 
You said something that I made note of and I, and I really hung on to, and that was that at the beginning of any show, you only let in media that is relevant to the show you're about to work on. Did that apply here and how? Man, it was a, uh, it depended on which episode I was working on on which day. So that was kind of a challenge for this because at one point I was editing the first three episodes at the same time, which are three completely different tones. Because one is kind of in the mold, I would say, of Contagion, Thriller. Uh, two, which is Whale Fall, is, is more of a... It, it veers into tone poem, but it's obviously a very somber affair. And then three is this kind of Hal Ashby ancestor comedy. Scott Burns directed episodes one and two. Greg Jacobs directed episode three. So switching back and forth between directors was also a bit of a, a bit of a pull, but I did try to silo myself off by the day. So I'd say, guys, Wednesday, I'm in with Greg. I'm doing comedy. We can't do whale stuff on Wednesday. Like I can't cross those two streams. It's too far apart. But I could cross over between three and one if we have to, because one has some levity with the Matthew Reese character and the Walrus saga. Um, but two was one I really had to sign off. You mentioned a few things there that we have to touch on. But first, I wanted to ask you about where you edit. I think you told me when we were talking about brand new cherry flavor, you were going to cut this in New York, which is where it was shot. Mm -hmm. And I think you're heading back there again soon. So this is a question that I asked another editor not too long ago. And it was about the whole idea of where you need to live as an editor to get work, because it seems like more and more L.A. based editors are working outside of L.A., Atlanta or Toronto, Vancouver, London, New York City. Is there a trend there, a shift in the industry there? It seems like, you know what, you don't so much need to be L.A. based or is it still, yeah, you got to be in L.A. It's just you're going to be traveling. I think to get started in your career, I, I, I have a hard time imagining getting started or being an assistant and moving up and not being in New York or L.A. I think once you're established, it's much easier to be somewhere else because there is so much tax incentive based travel. The only reason I was in New York is because of the tax incentive. It, you know, Scott did come in and we did do a lot of great stuff together. He and I love working in person. Um, that's a big deal for us. I don't do much of anything remote unless the situation is very, very extreme. I like to have the room open. I like to have my assistant there. I work really closely with my post producers. So we all are kind of committed to being in person. And Scott certainly is too. Um, but that was... Really, he was so busy, it was almost exclusively for tax purposes to have me up there, to travel me there. So I guess just to reiterate, it's like, yeah, to get started, it's very difficult for an editor or a producer or a post supervisor to get to know you remotely. I think it's much easier to become work friends and get to know each other's particular set of skills when you're in the same room with each other on a regular basis. I think once you establish that rapport, it's much easier to kind of put yourself out in the wind and be in Santa Fe or Austin or wherever and then say, oh, well, I'm going to be in New York anyway. But I will say this, no one is traveling anyone to LA to work. <laughs> There's plenty of people in LA that are already working. There is a lot of traveling to Toronto, Atlanta, New York location editing to save some, get some bucks back. Incentives aside, financial incentives aside, when you're working in New York and Scott's shooting the series in New York, does it benefit you at all to be near set, on set? Do you actually ever visit set? How does that help you or hinder you as an editor? Every now and then someone points a sharp stick at me and makes me go to set. And uh, I don't like it. And it's not because I don't love all of our craftspeople. I think that the naivete that I have as an editor from the making of the thing is kind of a superpower. So if I never see the set and I don't know that the chair is over by the door, the only geography that matters to me is what's on the monitor when we're editing, what the audience is going to see. So a lot of times I'll have put the room together wrong based on the camera language and someone will come in and say, oh, but that ottoman, you know, it wasn't over there. That doesn't matter to me you know, one iota because no one else will ever know that. I know how to build it for the scene, for the show. That's one thing that's very practical. The other thing is emotional. I don't want to know what was hilarious on the day. 
I don't want to know that that day was really hard and it rained and we didn't get it all or today so-and-so didn't bring their A game. I don't want to know any of that because none of that matters once I have it in the avid. None of that matters. So to be able to have distance from that, I can say objectively to people that come in, hey, you know what? I think this works great. I know that day was hard. I know you don't want to relive it, but this material works beautifully. So I don't like to go to set. I will say also to your point, Scott and I have what I think he would agree with, a really great relationship and rapport. So, you know, we do take advantage a lot of being in the same place during these times. But he's very rarely focused on, he doesn't want to see assemblies for the most part. There might be one thing he wants to see. And if I wasn't in New York, I could have assembled it and posted it on PIX. I probably assembled it in New York and posted it on PIX for him to review. He does come in every now and then on a Saturday, but it's almost always a kind of philosophical meeting. He doesn't really give many notes on whatever he sees. He just kind of, every now and then he wants to get a little taste and then he wants to share with me, hey, we're seeing it evolve this way or one thing we're worried about is this, keep your eyes peeled for it. He doesn't really want to act on it until he's done with the shooting part. Well, I'm sure it's probably director dependent, but do you have a preference in terms of, I want a little more direction. I do appreciate those notes because I don't want to be wasting my time. I want to be getting as close to your vision ultimately as possible. Or do you prefer that approach where it's just leave me alone for the assembly and then we can sit down and really hammer this out? Well, not to cop out on the question, but I I like it all the ways. I, I like to, it's totally director showrunner dependent. I want to give them what they need you know, especially if we're mostly discussing during production, I want to give them what they need to keep going with confidence. I want them to feel like they have a grasp from me on how it's going. But I very rarely had an experience where it wasn't going like pretty well. I mean, you know, we're always going to be going to fix it in post, but I, I, I very rarely will call set and say, hey, I don't think you got it. You know, at at a minimum, I'd say, hey, I'm feeling like this is coming through is pretty somber. Just making sure that's what you're looking for would be a note that maybe I gave on this show, you know, on on extrapolations. I might have said, hey, you know, we're watching Sienna and we're just I'm just making sure you want it to be. This is what you want. And, And of course, it was like, yeah, this is what we want. Like, this is the one where this is the morning episode. You know, not morning as an a.m., but morning as in grieving. So it was really coming through well with Sienna, especially since she was acting in front of a blue screen. But traditionally, I will do as much in-person work as they can do, but I can edit without them there as well. I don't know why it reminded me of this, but talking to Matt Chasse, we were talking about um, a man called Otto, and he was just talking about how when he's going to work on location, he has a hand in like finding the space, finding the rooms, figuring out where they're going to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a very important part of it for me, even if we're local, but especially if we're on location. I want to make sure that I'm set up that I like the way that my assistant's room is, that she's going to be happy with that. I want to have a room that I'm comfortable in, but also that if people need to come in and screen is going to be comfortable, welcoming. I'm very much a vibe feng shui edit room guy. It's super important to me that the room is telling a story of how the edit is going. So for instance, on Extrapolation, we had Meryl Streep came in to watch a screening of an episode once. Sienna Miller came in to watch a screening of an episode once. Scott's always in and out. He's often bringing really interesting people from science or environmentalists in to watch cuts. So it's like, I need to have a room where everybody that comes in feels like, oh, this is must be going really well. There's no, it's not full of takeout boxes and scraps of paper on the wall. You know, it's pretty organized. It's looking pretty neat. Uh, But I do. And then proximity. I mean, you know, if I'm being frank, I don't want to be too close. I don't want the edit rooms to be too close to set. At a certain point, if you're too close, you might as well have a room on the soundstage, which I've done before. and And it was fine. But I don't want to tie people up during lunch having to try to commute over. So I like being just far enough away that no one's going to try to show up during lunch for 30 minutes and screw up the whole production day, you know. Okay, so other than the vibe and the feng shui of it all, the actual technical part of it, what is your current setup in terms of the editing system, monitors, audio monitoring? You know, when we drop by your cutting room, what does it look like? I'm doing three pretty big panels on the desk, one for the timeline and the source record windows, and then in the middle, and then the left one would be just bins, audio mixer, audio tool, 
et cetera, whatever I have open, the um, navigator. And then the right one is a full screen playback. And then I have a larger, probably 60 inch full screen playback for if people are in the room, but I don't really turn that on unless someone's in there watching with me. I use just the tools at the desk for the most part. And then I've been still using Avid 2018. Shh, don't tell anybody. I would never tell anybody. Yeah, it's a workhorse. It's a tank. I love it. So that's still been what we're using. And then I bring a very low profile lighted keyboard that doesn't give me a carpal tunnel and like a $3 wireless mouse that I kind of travel with. I have 60 of them so that I can always find one. They're the same brand. They're these little Logitech things. They're super cheap. They're great. And when you have people in to watch your cuts, are they sitting in front of you? I find that more and more editors are like, no, nah, I don't want people over my shoulder. So they're now, the editors are now at the back of the room with a couch in front of them. Mm -hmm. This way, you're never going to see my bald spot while I'm editing. <laughs> I'm not thinking about whether somebody's checking out my bald spot. Uh, yeah, I moved to the behind the client a couple of years ago and I couldn't imagine doing it any other way now. It just feels like just a better dynamic. It feels more like you're captaining a ship. I feel like, you know, I'm a little bit elevated if I can be, if I can find a room with a riser, I'll take it or if they can bring me one in, but it's good. And then that way they're experiencing the audio from the front. I'm hearing what they're hearing. I've got the monitor, the audio monitors up with the client monitor and it's been a good setup for me so far. Well, before we dig more into the actual show itself, I do enjoy talking about the working relationships and the career aspects of working with somebody like Scott. Yeah. Last time, as I said, when we spoke, it was about Brand New Cherry Flavor and Nick Antosca, and you did Channel Zero with him and the act, and of course, Brand New Cherry Flavor. And then with Scott, the report, and then I think an episode of the series, The Loudest Voice. I'd like to know, are there pluses and minuses of being tied to specific people? On the plus side, you get to leverage that relationship over time to get a shot at directing or producing anything like that. And on the minus side, is it like, well, you that's fewer people that you're actually experiencing and learning from? Man, I don't think it's a minus at all. I mean, you know, Scott has been doing work in this business for a really long time. And he's a tremendous resource of knowledge for, you know, a lot of the great films we've seen. You know, he's worked on a lot of stuff that we know he's worked on, but he's also worked a lot of stuff behind the scenes on things like Bond movies and Star Wars movies and Fincher. And so I love working with him and in a contrast, but the same thing, you know, Nick and Tosca and I have really, I think, grown together a lot. I mean, we were both kind of babies in this industry when we did Channel Zero. And, you know, I, it just, he had to do a show recently for Peacock that I wasn't available for because I was on Extrapolations and it broke my heart thinking he was doing a show without me. Just, I just kept thinking like, oh man, I wonder how it's going. You know, trying not to bug them. I don't see any minuses to to having these relationships. I, I look at it as the the plus. It's true collaboration. Like I know these guys. I would throw Amy Simons in there too, who's a brilliant genius who I did Girlfriend Experience season one and two with. I helped on her feature. She dies tomorrow a, a little, and she directed an episode of the show that I'm on now. And I know these people, and they know me, and that lets us really be doing art and not dancing around the kind of work part of it in terms of like, oh, I have to make sure this is to a certain level of refinement before I can show it because I don't want them to think I'm not up to the task, which I know is something that I really struggled with early in my career. I think a lot of editors do. But with these people that we're talking about here, you're running a relationship with somebody over the course of three or four shows. They know that you can do it. You can show them something much faster by not having to sound design it for two days first. Well, despite how close you two are now, there was a time when you were meeting Scott for the first time. I think to put the proper context around extrapolations, we should talk about how you met Scott on the first project you did together. Yeah, I got recommended to him for the feature, the report by Steven Soderbergh, who I'd worked with on The Girlfriend Experience. So he recommended me to Scott and I met Scott. Uh, and I was very intimidated. If he hears this, which he probably will, he'll have a good laugh at that. Mm -hmm. I was very intimidated because I was so familiar with so much of his work and such a big fan of his writing. And I, he had directed a feature for HBO called PU239 that I had not seen at that time. And he had done some episodic and commercial directing. But for all practical purposes, it was his directorial debut. But the script was really brilliant. I overprepared for the script. I was very familiar with the events of the script that he was writing about from before. I'm kind of a political junkie, amateur. Anyway, and so when I came in and I knew a lot of the people that were referenced in the script, I think he connected to that. And we had a very perfunctory 
short meeting. And at the end of it, he all but said, like, see you in New York. And we made that feature together, very collaborative. He was in every single day. That was a very hands-on collaborative. Him and I edit along with his associate producer, Sarah Miller, who was there every day. And it just, it went awesome. And then he did that. We, I was really happy with the film. I think I know he was too. And then he did an episode of Loudest Voice. He did the finale of Loudest Voice for Showtime. And he called me to work on that with him. And then when Extrapolations came up, he brought me in pretty early, which is the other good thing about having these long relationships with filmmakers is that, you know, he brought me in on Extrapolations, I mean, probably right after Meryl Streep. I think it was Meryl Streep and then me. Uh, I'm like half joking. (laughs) But, you know, he sent me the script for Whale Fall and the script for Fifth Question. He said, this is a thing we're going to do with Apple and it's going to be a big deal. And what do you think about getting on board? I don't have to think twice about that. That's... Sure. Where do I have to be and when? Well, I'm going to ask you more questions about those scripts and the show itself in a second, but I wanted to go back to the pluses and minuses. You just illuminated like, hey, one of the pluses is that I get brought in early. Mm -hmm. Well, when I asked that question, I kind of casually threw in producing gigs. And here on Extrapolations, yet again, you are a co-producer. And I think you were as well on Brand New Cherry Flavor. Mm -hmm. So tell me about what that title actually means in the context of this show and how important is it in the career of an editor to have titles like that? I don't think it's important for the career of an editor. I think the way that I edit, I'm very hands-on whether they like it or not. And so I think at a certain point, people just started saying Greg's going to want to weigh in on all this stuff. So we might as well have him around and put producer by his name so people don't forget to add him to the email. But (laughs) it's um, for the way that I edit on these shows, I am really, I work really closely with the post-producers. So I'm weighing in on the editor's perspective, I'm giving them my perspective on scheduling certain budgeting things. Like I'm not going to pretend like I'm under the hood on the budget. I'm not, but they might say, Hey, this a costs X and B costs Y. Does this matter to you? Uh, staffing is a big, big one. The other editors that are going to be on the show, the assistants, the vendors, hiring sound people, hiring VFX people when it's applicable, hiring composers, I very rarely get involved in color. I kind of leave that one to my post producers and the DP and his whims or her whims. But I think the producing for me makes a lot of sense. I I don't think it's something that every editor aspires to. I mean, I work with great editors all the time who have no desire to get as far under the hood as I am. You know, they want to edit. They want to make the thing great. They want to get the edits to sing. I just think I'm cursed or blessed, depending on who you're talking to on which day with a high bandwidth. So I tend to become, for a lot of these TV series, especially sort of the encyclopedia for the show. So I tend to get a lot of random calls on a Wednesday night from a vendor saying, hey, do you remember like which time period, you know, this shot was taking place in? Because we have these screens and we don't remember. And like, I can usually call it up pretty easily. And it keeps them from having to bother the showrunner or director. And a lot of times there are also layers of protection around showrunners and directors. You're going through assistants, you're going through other producers, you're going through official channels. People, for whatever reason, have no trouble calling me in the middle of the night and asking me about a, a, you know, a, a mix up. The individual scripts aside, when Scott pitched the show to you, because this is a very challenging subject, the whole conceit of it is you are extrapolating out over many years If climate change is not properly addressed now, these are the consequences that we could be facing. But people are not always really open to those kind of things. It's like, I don't want, I don't want to have to think. I just want to, you know, be entertained. So that's kind of a a tightrope you have to walk. Well, you know, it's an interesting challenge anytime you get something that's non-conventional offered to you, because there's like exactly what you just said. Is, Is this going to be pulled off? Like, obviously, I feel like I can pull off the editing part. Like, I know that I can edit a show, but what can I bring to this other than just running the Abbott? And you nailed a lot of the hurdles with storytelling about climate change. I think we were all very, very aware of them the whole time. Scott has spoken a lot in the press. It's really easy to find about how he felt like he needed to try to make something that was entertaining so that people would watch it. I guess we'll find out from Apple when numbers are released how successful that was. But I think when I read it, what I felt was, this is the guy that wrote Contagion and produced An Inconvenient Truth. He's trying to tell an important story. It was during COVID when he sent me the script. So the Contagion prophecy of it all was fresh. And I just felt like, A, 
I will feel better about climate change immersing myself in this with Scott and the scientists that he has on board. Like he's getting his information from the right people. And I know that about him because I've known him for long enough to know that that's how he rolls. So what I'm going to learn is going to be real. It's not going to be talking points and spin. It's going to be real. And, you know, I think we all have a responsibility when something is brought to us that could bring some good in the world. I think we all have a responsibility to say yes. I think at least I do. But the first thing I read was the whale fall episode, which, of course, is just a devastating story. And then the second one was the fifth question, which is the hurricane synagogue episode, which is more of like a, hey, this is up to us. And so I thought that the duality of those two themes between those two episodes coming from the same voice, I thought that was really interesting. And I was really excited to get in the mix. And the first thing you pitched me is we don't want these to be the same. They're going to have different directors. They're going to have different writers. Some of the actors will cross over. They may be acting in different tones from episode to episode. This is intentional. This is what we want. And so that, I thought that was a terrific idea. And composers too. It was, it's like, well, they're going to have different composers. The scores aren't going to be in the same thing. I thought that was really interesting. It sounded like a lot of fun. So did you basically approach each episode as like, well, this is its own movie. I mean, do you not even really think about how it relates to the other ones, if it does at all? Totally. There were science and story things that had to be considered. So especially science, there was a lot of, if you watch the title sequences of each show, they're on one arc of climate change, temperature, warming, sea level rise, species lost. There are a lot of factors that they're tracking, but they're all from the same version of, I'm going to do my best not to butcher this. What Scott wanted to do was choose one possible path for where the world goes if we don't act on climate change and follow that through. So it didn't vary once he decided, okay, we're not going to do anything. Carbon's going to go this high. That everything else was extrapolated from that one grab. So he said, you could do another season where people act a little, you know, like, and then that extrapolation grab would be different and temperature wouldn't go up quite as much. Sea level wouldn't rise quite as much. So that piece of science from that graph had to be followed in every episode. So when we were doing VFX for the Florida episode, episode three, we had to pay attention to how much water we were putting in those plates because we couldn't have the sea level rise too much, or that doesn't make sense anymore for where we say that it's going. It has to track with what we're going to see when New York has to build the seawall in episode four, right? If you put Florida totally underwater, then in episode four, that seawall has got to be way higher to keep that arc consistent. But from a tonal perspective, no, they didn't have to relate to each other. So episode one, always one of the more challenging ones in terms of just like getting the thing off on the right foot. Tell me about tackling that open and the momentum that's required for the viewer to stay through the whole series. Yeah, we treated the first three as one kind of project in that mindset because we knew they were going to release the first three at the same time. And personally, the way that I approach them was the first episode was about anxiety over climate change. The second episode was grieving the fact that this is here. We're not going to get rid of it. We're going to have to deal with it. And the third episode was about starting to feel like we need to do something about it. And so I thought that when I approached each one with that emotional mindset, that kind of gave me a guide. I mean, you know, the first one is very much like Contagion. It's, it's, a, it's a story about a lot of different characters that's happening simultaneously. Some of them cross over some, but not all. The very, very opening of the series, we, we tried. It's at least the third completely different iteration of the opening that I can think of. There was a pretty heavy VFX shot opening that we abandoned pretty early on. We never really got much past previs on it. Then there were several written versions that we just would slug in. We would just to try to sort of, we'd use stills and slugs to try to get through, get the idea across to Apple and to the producers. And then when we settled on this opening, the crazy part of it is we kind of decided to do it. We were talking through the idea in the room. And at a certain point, I said, I think I got it. Let me just cook for a minute. I think I know what to do. And I'll have something for you in the morning. And I essentially, Steph Perez, my assistant on the show, who also co-edited a couple episodes, her and I pulled a whole bunch of stuff from YouTube. 
of current modern day climate. So all the hurricane stuff, we pulled it with knowing we would have to replace a lot of it with clearable clips, but it just really quickly, we were able to tell the story of like fire, flood, famine, refugees. Because all of those clips from the beginning of episode one are from now. The VFX we did was have a drone pull the lifeboat or we added like a little more fire to a shot or a little more smoke. We put the news banners up. We added the newscasters. But that really was all based on the idea that I had from the beginning, which is like, this is anxiety. Like, how do you express anxiety now? I think it's very internet clip heavy feeling. That's how I think about anxiety, at least. There's like a lot of internet clips attacking me. In that first episode, you meet Sienna Miller, you meet David Diggs, and then second episode, it's all Sienna, and then the third episode, it's all David. So did you find that you were shifting the balance between how much you focused on each of those characters in that first episode, knowing that each would have their own episode in two and three? I think the trick really was making sure when we were in scenes with the characters that were going to recur, that I tried to make those scenes intentionally subjective to them. So knowing that David was going to come back in such a big way, I didn't want to make anything subjective to his father, say, that I didn't need to. There are moments where uh, he does have scenes, the father has scenes with just he's in, but if you look at all the scenes with David, they're all from his point of view. Same thing with Sienna, even when Tahar's in a scene with her, I made sure to do whatever I could do to skew it to feel like it was her scene. And that's a lot of times that's just coverage choices and just timing. It's just a feeling more than a, than a technical execution. But I think that was the main thing I did with the recurring characters for the first three. Um, really, what the trick with that episode was to find, <laughs> to emotionally anchor it to them. It was really what order the scenes happened in. Because that episode was very, very, very malleable in terms of like, this could happen over here instead, or Nick Milton can look at his pool over here and then we'll start thinking about the glacier faster. So it was so malleable. It really did. I think that, I think that was the last episode that we finished. I'm I'm almost positive. It's either last or next to last. You've mentioned a few times the tonal swings in this series, even within an episode. I mean, episode one, and I think you hinted at this, there's a death by walrus You know, when you say it like that, it sounds kind of funny, but it's not played for laughs. Mm -hmm. Are you ever at risk of comedy undermining the message? Or do you look at it as comedy makes it easier for the audience to accept that message? I think both things can be true. I think in the case of the first episode of Extrapolations, I think we were pretty careful with what levity there was. I think you know, I think the objective observer could ask for more or less, but I do think you hit on something really insightful, which is that too much comedy does tend to undercut, especially in the first episode. For instance, I think in episode three, the comedy works beautifully. I think it does a great job of making the exact point that we want to make. But in episode one, you can't really apply those same rules because A, like you said, you're giving people a map to watch the show. So you do want them to have a license to laugh in the show at large, but you don't necessarily want them laughing too much during episode one, which again is this kind of big, anxious, sprawling, flashing red light, you know? In an anthology, it seems like that context world building you did in the first episode, you kind of got to do a little of that in each episode. Or do you look at it like, well, if they're in on this series, they saw the first one, even though it's an anthology, I can just sort of move on with this new story. I think you could do it either way. I think we as a show chose the latter. I think we wanted you to be able to kind of watch any episode. We'd like for you to watch them all. But if someone just wanted to pick one and watch it, you could watch it as a little movie. I think that helped with switching composers, switching DPs, you know, switching writers, switching directors. I think they all have something that is bespoke and unique to them. Again, like other than the recurrings, which really the ones to consider are. Sienna, David, and Tahar to a certain extent. I think other than them, I don't think anyone in four, in episode four, recurs at all in the Edward Norton episode. I think we suggest Kit Harrington's on the other side of a phone call, but I think that's it. So it was really about telling the right story in the right way for that episode and for that genre and for that tone. So for this episode, a lot of Meryl Streep's performance is given as a synthesized voice of a whale. You mentioned that tomorrow you're supervising some ADR. Mm -hmm. 
that part of the job for an editor? Is that a good way for an editor to learn new tricks, working with an actor in that way? And did you work with Meryl in ADR for this? I did not work with Meryl for ADR. When you get to that rarefied air, you need the showrunner. You need the heavy hitters for that. You need the showrunner and the director for that. I think I was invited to the session, but that was still a little covid at that time. And it, I think I had a, a, a runny nose. I'm like, no way. I'm not going not gonna to endanger America's treasure. Um, <laughs> But I did do almost all of the other actors, sometimes with Scott, sometimes without. I, I like doing it. I mean, again, it's you when you work so hard to build something in the avid, it's impossible for me to imagine someone else finishing it. So I just see all of the arms of finishing as being part of the editing. It's like I built this thing, I'm sweating and bleeding all over it. I'm just going to, you know, trust like someone I may have not met to just get this ADR correct. Because if they're just replacing a line and matching, that's one thing. That's easy. But, you know, a lot of times now, more and more, every show I work on, there's more and more creative ADR. There's more and more lines we add that get written. Then, then those need to be performed properly to match. You know, you need to have an emotional consistency to those lines. So you need someone there that understands the whole thing. And I am probably not the best at directing verbally these like, you know, A-list actors. I'm sure you can find someone better than me to do it. But what I can do is I can tell them, hey, this is why this is here. This is what we were aiming at. You know, if you don't like the line, feel free to tweak it or whatever. But just making sure we get the right emotional beat. It's always the most important thing to me. But when you do do it, do you find that you learn anything from working with those actors or is it really more of a one-way thing where you're just informing them and helping them? It's a lot of like face your fears. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> sitting in front of a microphone and saying, oh, how do I phrase this correctly? I mean, I guess, you know, if I wanted to direct, I guess it'd be helping me learn to direct. You do learn a lot about speaking, saying as few words as possible to get the desired point across. I think that's something you definitely pick up. I also just like hanging around sound guys. I think sound guys are cool. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of always a good hang, you know, when you get to go in. Who doesn't love the sound team? Yeah. Speaking of the sound team, episode three, you get to do a musical number finally in episode three. You get to do the Sing in the Rain bit. Yeah. Tell me about your approach to doing somewhat of a musical within this series. It was cool. That was part of the script early on. Uh, Greg Jacobs, the director of that episode, directed among other things, the second Magic Mike movie. So he had some experience doing uh, musical and musical adjacent things, and he was really excited about it. I mean, I wish I could say the edit on it was really complicated, but he did such a good job shooting it. There were only so many choices to be made. One thing that was really cool is that we did with VFX was perfect all the timing which I had not thought about. So like making sure the umbrella spin together at the exact same time, making sure all the stomps and two shots that splash hit at the exact same time. So we did a lot of little tweaking as we went through after we finished the edit on it. We finished the edit on that musical sequence first. We got that done like right away, just in order to make sure that we were going to get everything we needed. But they recorded the song beforehand. So David obviously is a talented musical actor that we all know from Hamilton and many other things. So he was born to do it. And Nesca, the actress that acts next to him, I think it was her first acting job, but she did such a good job in the show, but particularly in that sequence, she just did such a wonderful job. But it just I'll say that editing musical is not that much different than editing a choreographed action sequence. It's, it's all the same principles and, and it's all you bring to, as an editor, you bring to it the same thing you bring to those, which is really just a sense of timing. It, it, you, you apply your own sense of timing to this kind of like really well choreographed and photographed thing, but it didn't evolve much after that first or second assembly, believe it or not. Considering that degree of choreography, does that challenge your traditional, I don't want to be on set, I don't want to know what goes on, or something like that? No. Okay. I'm telling you, man, I am set averse. Like, if someone said, you know, they wanted to hire me for a movie, they wanted me to be on set all the time, I'm sure if it was a project I wanted to do with someone I loved, I would do it. But I would, I feel like I am an extra nose on set. Like, there's no reason for me to be there. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Um there is a sequence in that episode where David Diggs enlists some help from David Schwimmer that he regrets getting some help with. I won't 
give it away. Mm -hmm. But in that confrontation between the two of them, you switch for, I believe, the first time in the episode to all low angles. The camera's mm -hmm. now down low looking up at the two men back and forth and sort of stays with that for a few beats. Obviously, you're not the cinematographer, but just your insight into why at that moment it was important to do that. I think what they were trying to do, and, and Zach Goller was the director of photography on that episode, who's super talented. And I think what he and Greg were looking for there was just a real change in coverage to show how surprised the rabbi was at the wreckage he caused by this moral compromise that he had made. I think he knew he was making a moral compromise when he made it, but I think now that the homeless shelter is gone, people know. I think he's starting to get concerned. I think it's a big enough emotional shift for him that it did require to break out of the coverage we had used for the rest of the show in a way that would be very noticeable. So those first three episodes of this, again, anthology are interconnected. Same characters show up in those first three. Episode four, a bit of an action movie vibe to it. Mm -hmm. Stars Ed Norton, among others. And Ed Norton is this scientist who, we don't get too much of his backstory, but he's, he's sort of like, do we trust him or not? Nobody's really sure that we can trust this guy. Mm -hmm. His ex-wife is, um, would you use the term eco-terrorist? She's basically doing something to address climate change when she feels like the world is not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I have to do something dramatic. And Ed Norton's saying, no, 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 you can't do that. It's going to have much worse ramifications than not doing anything. Who's the villain in this episode? I mean, I think in a way our appetites are the villain of all these episodes. Our appetites as the human race. I think, you know, episode four, the biggest challenge was Jonathan, played by Edward Norton, and his, and his wife, Gita. They, they are two sides of an argument that we're going to have as a society sooner rather than later about how much we should intervene when we don't know what the fallout is going to be. And I think they're both making points that could be construed as viable and relevant and right. I don't think either are wrong. I don't think either are right. I think that's really when human drama becomes super interesting, right? Is when both of the characters are right and they're both wrong, that becomes like an unknowable solution. I think from Scott's perspective, I think he would say it expresses the difficulties in having these arguments when we've waited so long to do it and now we don't have time to test it and plan it. And when a solution, a possible solution or bandage does arrive, the stakes and the timing are so tight. How are we going to arbitrate this in time? I think we're trying to get at that. I mean, I think that's the kind of thriller we wanted to make and the style of fail safe or, you know, some movies of that ilk. Um, I think the, the actors in the episode did a great job of performing it with urgency. I think the music, David Wingo scored that one, I'm pretty sure, and did a great job of using the music to kind of push that. But yeah, that's our like thrilleriest one, I think. Yeah, I think so too. Mm -hmm. For each episode, I could ask you about VFX because in each episode, you're doing things like having to simulate this apocalyptic landscape. Mm -hmm. In this one, you've got um, you got a lot of screens, a lot of technology that you're simulating. Just tell me about the VFX load that you had to take on. Is it something you like to do? Do you like to really lean into doing temp effects? Is it something you hand off to an assistant? Or is it something you just altogether be like, no, I just need to get the tone right, the performance is right, and VFX will take care of the rest? I do the tone and the performance first, and then I hand off a lot of the temping to the assistants. And then in this case, we had a VFX editor, Alfonso Carrion, who was, who was great. Um, the VFX supervisor, Ashley Burns, is amazing. I'm learning a lot about VFX. This was a pretty steep learning curve. I mean, there were over 1,500 VFX shots in the, in the series. Um, just, I mean, all the screens, all the background enhancements. There, you know, Episode two was almost all blue screen. The, the whale episode, of course, we weren't really underwater. Um, spoiler alert for everybody watching <laughs> at home. But, um, you know, I've, I've found that the thing is, you it's not something I can control as an editor, but it is something that I can do my best to help influence for, for the best. We had a great, overall, we had a great VFX team on our side. Ashley was great. And I, I guess the thing that I would say to editors approaching their first big VFX job or thinking about doing VFX job is the, the main thing is that you're bringing on an, another collaborator, which is the VFX supervisor. That person is going to be someone who's going to be in the cracks with you. And you're going to want to understand what they do and what they need to do as much as you want to help them understand what you do and what you need to do. It really does become, it's just like 
you, you're working with the director, you're working with the composer. It's almost a little closer <laughs> relationship than with the composer because they're there for the whole time. They're always giving you the guardrails. So for instance, you, you mentioned the screens and that's really was one of the things that I think snuck up on me about this show is every single one of those screens has data. Some of them have photos. Some of them ha have timestamps. All that stuff has to be tracked. It's an immense, immense, immense amount of tracking information and story points across eight episodes of screens and making sure the screens evolve properly. Well, like, oh, wait, in episode six, they can't look cheaper and less evolved than they did in episode four. I mean, we have four different vendors uh, for VFX on the show. So there's a whole host of communication that's going on with Ashley, with them, that I, I can't be a part of. I mean, I'm busy editing. You know, he doesn't want me there anyway. He's got it under control. But just having that be a part of my day every day to, to work with him and try to say, hey, this is what's happening on this side. What's happening on your side? Sharing information, communicating, collaborating. That was the biggest part of it. And it was really fun. He, he was great. And I'm on another show now that has a lot of VFX. And the guy that's on that is really great, too. So I'm overall, I'm enjoying working in VFX more than I thought I would. Although if I never had to do another like actor talking to a blue screen, I would prefer <laughs> to not do that. I feel very bad for Sienna Miller and kudos for her for pulling that off because that whole episode is basically her in a blue screen. It's a really, really amazing performance, all things considered. Well, so aside from collaborating with VFX, collaborating with other editors, mm -hmm. you mentioned part of your role as co-producer is having a say in the hiring of other editors. When you're co-editing an episode with another editor, what is it you are looking for from them? Are there specific things that you like to say, well, this is, this is not really necessarily in my wheelhouse. I'd like you to work on this, or I'm looking for an editor that's really good at this. How do you decide what it is you need from that other editor to build a good team between the two of you? Yeah, I think there's a there's a couple different ways to to think about it. If I'm co-editing on the same episode with an editor is kind of one path. And then there's also a path where there's just another editor working on their own episodes, which in this case Tim Streeto did episodes 5, 6, and 7. And Tim is a much better editor than I am, so he needed very little from me uh other than the occasional pat on the back and then i would check him i'd have him watch stuff that i did and make sure that he didn't think i was screwing it up <laughs> but um we hired tim that was an easy hire i mean he was available and he said yes so that we that, that one didn't have to be second thought at all now if i'm hiring someone to collaborate with me as a co-editor you know there's a few different ways that can work you know sometimes i'm coming in on an episode that maybe I had more time than we thought. So it's, oh, maybe I do have time to work on episode three where we didn't think I was going to, or vice versa. Like, for instance, my assistant, Steph, who co-edited episode four and episode eight with me, both of those were cases where I was in the weeds. And I'm like, all right, Steph, you ready to step up? She had done it on Brand New Cherry Flavor with me as well. So I knew that she was capable and ready. And she's always excited to get her hands dirty and express herself in that way. So she actually did the lion share of episode eight early. So she did all the dailies and she did the director's cut. And then I came in right at the end of her editor's cut. I helped out a little bit for a weekend. And then after director's cut, as everything else kind of fell away, I kind of handled all the studio notes and stuff. And of course, kept her in the loop so that she could see how it evolved. But that works really well for me because I know her. If I was hiring someone from scratch that I knew I was going to co-edit with, I would want to find somebody who I thought was good at something that I wasn't good at. So it would depend on the material, but I would definitely be looking for someone that could do something that I couldn't do. When we were talking in the weeks leading up to this interview, I mentioned that I had read that in production, they were very eco-conscious mm -hmm. as to how they did production. And I sort of joked with you like, well, did they do that in post as well? And you said... We're very aware of our carbon footprint in post already. Yeah. But it reminded me of, of something you said in our last interview, totally unrelated. I asked you about the way you set up your Avid interface and your timelines. And you said, I keep it very clean. Editorial hygiene is very important to me, which is, yeah. which is a phrase I'm never going to let go of, editorial hygiene. Yeah. So has that changed at all? How would you describe your approach in extrapolations to how you put together your Avid UI? 
I need the editorial hygiene to be even better because I have VFX editors touching my sequence. So I have to be able to see if they've done something. So if my timeline's really clean, I can tell right away if they've added a track, like if they put a new work in progress in or if they've marked something up. A lot of times they'll leave me notes in the markers or I'll leave notes for them in the markers. So I think editorial hygiene is much more important on a show of this size. Um, I, you know, I think I said this when we did it before, but a lot of that for me is because I look at the timeline and I can see where the scenes change. If I've got everything set up the way that I want, it's checkerboarded properly. I can really see visually if I'm working with the director and say, oh, go to the part where the dinosaur comes out and eats somebody. Like I know that that's vaguely in scene 20. I can kind of look at the timeline and see about where that lands. Whereas I've noticed when I've taken over timelines from other editors in the past, and not that there's a right way or wrong way to do it. Every editor needs their own. I think the timeline is like a picture of your brain in a way. It's like a CAT scan. So everybody's has to be the way that they're going to be able to read it and work with it the most fluidly. But I've taken over timelines before where it just looks like one long thing, like all of the productions just on V1 and all, you know, I'm just thinking like, gosh, how do these guys know where if, if somebody says go to, you know, whatever scene, how do they know where to land? I never thought about adding that CAT scan feature to Media Composer, but that's interesting. We'll talk about that offline after because I've trademarked that. Oh, it's now part of the public record. So whatever comes from that, I'm sure you'll get the credit. Last question. And again, it was a question I asked you on Brand New Cherry Flavor, but at the time it was in the context of working on sort of a psychological thriller, horror, being immersed in that world for so long. What does that do to your psyche? Same thing here with extrapolations. You are in this world of apocalyptic effects of climate change. And now that you're done with it, how has it changed you as an editor? How has it changed you as a, as a citizen of the world, I guess? I think the citizen of the world question, in a way, is the more interesting one. I mean, I, I mean the worst effect of it is I became like a, cl a climate change know-it-all to everybody in my life for a couple months. So I'd like to apologize to them real quick if I can. But uh, I think I, you know... This is going to happen to an extent, climate change. It's happening. It's, it's going to happen. There's no version of this timeline that we're living in going without any of it. So I think being immersed in it, and especially being immersed in it with Scott, who I know is a, you know, a, a researcher. He, he's not one to, you know, make stuff up or embellish. He, he's coming at you with the real stuff. And I, I think knowing... You know, for instance, uh, one thing I'll say that's a cool fact about this show is we had access to all the research that the, all the department heads, there was a box account and you could go into every episode and you could read all of the research everybody had. So everything from like published articles to like white papers to like excerpts from a book to whatever anybody had found for an episode would go into the box account for that episode. So if I was working on episode four, I could go in and I could read to my heart's content about the pros and cons of geoengineering, what kind of research was already being done, who was doing it, where, um, same thing for sea level rise or, you know, species extinction list. And to me, I would rather know as much as I could know and, and I think I got to a place of acceptance about this and, and it makes it easier for me. I have less existential anxiety about it than I did before I started. But uh, as an editor, you know, I think doing something this big, I think every time any of us step out and do something that's, I think in this case, we'll use scale. Anytime you step out and you do something that's a bigger scale than what you've done before, I think there's always a little bit of like, oh man, am I going to be able to do this? And then about halfway through, you realize that, it's all the same. You're doing the same thing you did on the million dollar indie or the, you know, or, or the or the commercial that you did in, in your in your basement, you know, over Zoom during COVID. It's the same thing. If you apply your same principles and your taste and your rhythms that make you yourself as an editor to anything, it will work. It doesn't matter how big the scope is. Don't get tricked by the scope. The thing we're still doing is emotional storytelling. Well, that's a good point. I guess ultimately it is kind of all the same. Yet at the same time, even though it's only been two interviews between brand new cherry flavor and now extrapolations, you cover a lot of ground. You do a lot of interesting stuff. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Mr. and Mrs. Smith coming soon on Amazon Prime. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Smith. That sounds like it'll be fun, especially if Greg is cutting it. A big thank you to Mr. O'Brien for talking with us today. As you heard, he's a busy guy. Although, how busy could he be if he never goes to set? 
but he is pretty busy editing and supervising ADR and all that stuff, so it was very cool of him to make time for us. Something that would not only be cool, but smart, is for you to make time to check out what's new with Avid Media Composer. And you don't even have to make much time to do that. Just takes a few clicks. But that first click is always the hardest. That's why I put a link in the show notes for you, right in this very podcast, to help you on your way. And now I'm on my way. Out of here anyway. Show's over. Hope you had fun. Please don't forget to reach out anytime you like with suggestions, requests, questions, concerns, recipes even. Whatever you like. It is always good to hear from you. So until next time, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.